Hey guys, Hello Bella here, and today I'm going to be reviewing the book I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness by Austin Channing Brown. And this is a book that I was able to get through in about two days. It's a relatively short book, and I think that it should be on everyone's reading list if you are trying to make a commitment as a white person to be anti-racist. And that is something that I wanted to take on. Within the last few years, I've just kind of noticed the shift that has been happening in our country and just kind of wanting to do my part but not to make it about me and I feel like this book does a good job of explaining why black people get so frustrated when race conversations come up with white people because white people often find a way to make it about themselves and they find a way to feel bad about it and turn their white guilt into something that totally derails the conversation. So we're going to get into some of the points in the book that she touches on and the book is full of stories of her school experience growing up going into a predominantly white school and then going into college and having more professors who taught her things about black culture. She also talked about how working in a Christian environment and working for the church, how she was one of the only black employees and how the diversity and inclusion programs oftentimes hurt the people of color that they hire because they expect the people of color they hire to take on the emotional burden and the teaching and all of the problems associated with making the institution that they're working for a more diverse place and a more inclusive place and putting a lot of that that workload and that blame onto the shoulders of people of color. I think it's great to read something like this because for me it challenges a lot of things that I've been taught growing up. Growing up in Alabama, um, I was raised by rural southern people and of course there was racism in my community and throughout my life I've seen so many examples of racism that is still prevalent today so I'm trying to educate myself that's the best way that I know how to do my part and that's what I'm trying to do is try to read books like this so let's just get into the book and I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the points of the book that I found the most interesting so you might notice that the author's name is Austin and that the author is a girl so it's not a typical girl name. Austin's parents chose her name for two reasons. One was that she was named after her grandmother's side of the family but the other reason was that her parents knew that if she was going to be filling out job applications that everyone thought that Austin was the name for a white man. She was basically named to make her life a little bit easier as a woman of color. If people were expecting a white man she had a much better chance and she talks about how many rooms she has walked into in her life and having people expect a white man to walk in and just basically them second guessing and wondering what went wrong or what they didn't filter out and it's kind of crazy to think that there is so much bias that goes on in the applications process for jobs but it definitely happens it definitely happens for people of color and it definitely happens for women and just any kind of marginalized group and when applying for a job you know there's all these boxes to check and my first thought when I'm seeing all that is like why do you need to know someone's race or someone's gender identity to hire them for a job so the first quote that I found moving to me in the book and basically she talks about this is what the book is about is my story is not about condemning white people but about rejecting the assumption sometimes spoken sometimes not that white is right it's about surviving in a world that's not made for me. She talks about her shopping experiences and going to the store with her mom and dad and them coaching her on how not to look like you are stealing. She wasn't allowed to touch things and then put her hands in her pockets and her parents were basically preparing her for a lifetime of being a black shopper and I've seen it a lot of times. I've seen black women get mad and leave stores because they're being followed especially here in Alabama. I've seen Black women have to go through stuff that I'm doing the same exact thing that they're doing, but they're being followed around the store and I'm being asked if I need help with anything. When I was growing up, the history of slavery was taught through the lens of white people. It wasn't really taught through the lens of black people. You might have a small section in a book that was dedicated to a famous person in the black community, but it was mostly just talking about white people. And I realized that, you know, all of our education was whitewashed so that we would not have to feel bad about slavery we would not have to take any responsibility for it and that we would not you know think back on it that it didn't happen that long ago and that we're still benefiting from it is something that people d fail to acknowledge the people who profited off of slave labor now have generational wealth where the people who were enslaved are now trying to just climb up the economic ladder the best they can one of the things 
Austin says is, like many black students in a predominantly white school, if I wanted to see myself reflected in the curriculum, I had to act on my own behalf. So she also goes on to say that like when she was chosen to do a book report, she chose a black person. If she had to study someone in medicine, she chose a black person. I think representation is so important. And if you've ever watched something with someone like you in it, it really does make you feel some type of way. If I see you know, a short, chubby, southern white lady on something, I get excited because that person looks like me and talks like me and probably has things in common with me and on a, on a level that maybe nobody else could understand. It is important for black people to be represented and not just in a way that is, you know, almost like virtue signaling. I see a lot of companies using uh, the Black Lives Matter movement to sell merchandise, but I don't know that they're really doing a lot to help black people. They're just using black people to sell things. Going in places like Target and seeing their gigantic displays of merchandise and just seeing something like that commercialized and I mean I don't I don't know as a white person what to think about that but I've heard a lot of other black people say that it feels disingenuine to see that after so long now that it's cool to be inclusive and diverse now they can sell the merchandise but before when it wasn't being talked about it was just completely ignored and so I think there's something to be said for jumping on an existing bandwagon that's safe and that's already been proven to work by more ethical companies now they are choosing to you know do that themselves in a time where there's not as much risk involved in being like a woke company. One of the points that she brings up in the book is that White people constantly come to black people to confess their sins of racism and they want black people to tell them, oh, it's okay, you're not a racist, it's fine, your, your ancestors didn't own mine, it's cool, we're all good, there's nothing to worry about. Most of it comes down to wanting to be absolved of any of that white guilt, that feeling that we've done something wrong and what it does basically is it it takes the focus off of the issue when really it shouldn't be about white people at all. And I feel like white people constantly derail conversations in uh, certain spaces. Like if you go to certain diversity events, you'll find that the white people are the ones getting up and speaking and doing things. And I've always found that to be strange. I've also found it really strange when the head of diversity and inclusion is a white man in certain companies. I just don't understand that at all. It doesn't make sense to me. The main question is why do you think black people should have to hear about how white people feel bad about racism? How does that help them? How does that make their pain go away? How does that contribute to activism or positive change? Better yet, how does that even change the way that they go through the world? For you to feel bad about it, things that happened in the past, how does that change what you're doing now? Because guilt without any kind of action is kind of pointless. It's kind of useless. It's just one of those emotions that we use to make ourselves feel better. I went to Instagram to find some posts from the black community who could speak on this better than me. The first one that I found was from a therapist and she said that seeking approval or validation from black people isn't part of being an ally. And I think that this is so interesting that white people think that in order to be an ally, they need to go up to black people, confess all their white racist sins, and they will be absolved and they will get a stamp of approval from the black community as an ally. And it's just like, why do you think that black people are so frustrated with dealing with white people? It's because constantly they are bombarded with these stories and this emotional burden that they're not getting paid to deal with. Personally, if I confess to something to someone and I spend their emotional labor dealing with it to me that's the job of like a therapist that's not the job of every black person to listen to the feelings of white people so one of the questions that was asked was how can you make your white guilt productive how can you do something with that white guilt to make a positive change so I found this graphic and one of the things it says is speaking about anti-racism Stop apologizing to validate your ego. It's not about you. And if you think it's about you, you're doing it wrong. Putting techniques into practice 
Don't just be performative. Don't just make posts just to make them. Make this part of your daily life. Choose to call out racism when you see it. The last thing is lend your white space to people of color. This could come in many forms. This could come in speaking at a conference, uh, giving a talk in a meeting. This could come from, you know, sharing ideas, letting more black people share their ideas. Black people are constantly interrupted. They're constantly, their ideas are put down or their ideas are stolen by white people and said in the exact same way. And then other white people suddenly approve the idea now that it has been said out of a white mouth. One of the last chapters is about a letter that she's writing to her unborn son. And she talks about how she loves to think about what he's going to be like when he grows up, what he's going to do with his dad, the games that they're going to play. She also has a part of herself that thinks, how are we going to have these conversations that we need to have to keep him safe when the time comes? How are we going to have the how to act when you're black around the police conversation? And how is he going to be perceived when he grows up and becomes a tall black man and he's walking around and he just is seen as a threat by people and it was really really a sad realization to think that you have an unborn baby and you're already thinking about how he's going to be marginalized just for his skin color. Austin talks a lot in this book about working for the church and personally I've found church to be one of the most isolating places that anyone can go to. They're very much like one of those, oh, we accept everyone, we love everyone. But when you actually get involved in the church, they can be very, very toxic. And I feel like she had to deal with that in the way that, you know, when she would complain about something or when she would go to HR and her company that was a faith-based company or a faith-based uh you know, employer, they would tell her that she had an attitude problem, that she was being aggressive, that she was being perceived by others in the office as threatening. When in reality, if anybody did the things that they were doing to her, to a white person, they would have went off on them, but she wasn't allowed to go off because then she would be perceived as the angry black woman. In her book, she says, Tone policing takes priority over listening to the pain inflicted on people of color. So this makes dialogue really difficult because people of color have to focus more on how they say things to not offend white people rather than what they actually want to say. Instead of just saying, oh, this is unacceptable, this treatment is not fair, this is ridiculous, they have to figure out a way to say it so that they won't offend white people. And I feel like this is something that White people have crafted the way that we word things in the work environment to the point of like, we have all these clever little ways of saying like, oh, you're not a team player. Oh, you're not on board with this. We really just need you to get on board with this. And they can almost like gaslight black people into believing that they're the problem. When she had people come into her cubicle and ask her to comment on race related issues that, you know, she was supposed to be the official spokesperson for black people and how much a emotional labor she had to give throughout her day just to be one of the few black staff who was employed at this place. It was so sad to listen to just how her day went versus some of her co-workers days went. The last thing I want to wrap up with is that this book kind of left me with the question of how do I show up for black people in a way that is not about me and in a way that creates positive change for them and is long lasting. So it's lasting through me, it's lasting through my children and their children and in a way that ultimately will shape a better world because I don't think that this stuff is going to happen overnight, but I think that even just someone from rural Alabama being raised the way that I was raised in the community that I was raised in, having these thoughts is not a very mainstream thought, honestly. Um, I know a lot of people who refuse to look at literature like this, a lot of people who refuse to read books that make them feel bad. And at, at first, when I first read, you know, one of my first books by a black person who was mad at white people, I did have a lot of resignation about it. I did think, oh my gosh, this is going to make me feel so guilty. This is going to make me feel so bad. I don't need to read this. This is going to bring, bring me down. And the more books that I read like this, the more books that I want to read like this. So if you're thinking about reading something like this, I highly encourage this book. This is an awesome book and it's a great starter book because it's really short and to the point and it has stories that everyone can probably relate to. Everyone's been treated some type of way that pissed them off and made them want to fight for positive change. So I hope that you guys enjoyed the video. Thank you so much for watching it. I will catch you in the next one. Take care.